I'm really, really excited to talk with you about my dear friend, Latanya Sweeney, who is going to be receiving the first Louis D. Brandeis uh, Privacy Award tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I had a lot of history about her to tell you, but uh, she's actually going to tell you something about herself, which I think is going to be much nicer and even more personal. But I want to tell you, in case you've been living under a rock, <laughs> just in case you've been living under a rock, Latanya Sweeney uh, has been really, I think, uh, one of the very first, maybe the maybe the very first computer scientist and scholar to think about the implications of privacy in healthcare. And uh, she began her work, I think it was pretty quickly after, after or during graduate school. And so, as you know, she's developed, um, she's applied her talents to issues of society, um, of governance, uh, technology, and of course, her particular interest in data privacy has been such a benefit to the American people. She is single-handedly the one <laughs> that pointed out that, um, you know what, de-identification, it's not really going to make data private, and so we have to do something. And uh, the, thing that, the thing that's most striking about her is, in all, with all of her knowledge and all of her interests, she manages to find research projects that really connect with and illuminate these critical issues for the public. So for example, some of you might know her work about the, uh, what's the name of those sleazy businesses? You know, the button that said, Latanya arrested? Oh, uh, the, the ads. The ads, yeah. So, so on Google search, um, she was, I guess, fooling around one day and you, know, and, you know, everybody does this sometimes, right? You Google your name and up came a little button that said, Latanya arrested? And she's like, what? Uh, <laughs> and you can imagine. So, so she, uh, she uh, quickly saw the potential of this, of this issue uh, because you have to click on the button. And then the button says, if you pay us $10, we'll tell you if Latanya was arrested. <laughs> so you can, you can picture the experiment. Of course, it had a wide variety of names that sounded of you know, different groups. So um, Jill Smith. Didn't get a button that said Jill arrested. But anyway, the point being, that it was a particularly brilliant experiment to show how the use of very little information about you, your name, your name, can be used to actually extort you <laughs> and discriminate against you. Because, you know, if you put your name into a search, so might a future employer, right? So that's the kind of that's the kind of way that she thinks about using computer science to show us the dangers of personal information online. And um, so we're all really thrilled that she's at the FTC. Um, what a stunning choice for them to get the nation's premier computer scientist <laughs> that's interested in, in data privacy to come work for them. Um, so that's where she is now, and uh, I wish other federal agencies would think like that. Like, why don't, why don't we get experts to come in and advise us, but, but uh, she sets an example for other agencies. And uh, well, there's one other story I had to tell you, uh, I wanted to tell you. I hmm, can't, can't quite catch it, but uh, maybe it'll come back. Maybe it'll come back after you're talking. So, so I'll let you start, but, uh, but uh, you know, she's, she's She's obviously my hero. She's a dear friend. I know many of you probably chased her for years <laughs> before you could catch up with her and get to talk with her. I know I did. I'm sure she thought I was stalking her at one point. But, um, but uh, no, the first computer scientist, this is what I was going to talk about. The first computer scientist I discovered that was interested in medical privacy was Ross Anderson in the UK. And, um, and I stalked him too, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and he is, he is very friendly online, and we got to know one another. And one of the first things I said to him was, Ross, Ross, where are the American computer scientists that care about privacy? And he said to me, well, gosh, Debs, I don't, I don't really know any. <laughs> so I had to find her for myself. That was my story. So please welcome LaTanya. 
uh, a dear friend, uh, a hero, a leader, a woman to follow and admire, and particularly, particularly needed today in the age of big data. And so, if you will welcome Latanya. Yes. Wow. Oh, this is this is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is the, the, the award is awesome. Having Justice Brandeis' grandson here is awesome. And so many uh, familiar faces here to share this time with me is also awesome. Uh, I'm very grateful to Patient Privacy Rights and to Dr. Peel for the work that they do and for thinking of me in such an amazing way. You know, uh, when you, this is definitely a peak in my life is getting this award, and it makes me think back on my own childhood. Um, at the age of six, I asked my great-grandmother, what do you call a person who likes math? A mather, a mathete, a mathman, or a magician? <laughs> my great-grandmother opened this old big dictionary that had always been on our family bookcase, and after working around the word, she said, the word is mathematician. A six-year-old girl who wanted to be a mathematician was an oddity my great-grandparents never understood, but they always supported. While my peers voiced ever-changing ambitions of becoming firemen, athletes, teachers, and teachers, um, numbers spun in my head. One plus one is always two. No matter how big the number, I can add one to get a bigger number still. A multitude of mathematical truths created a kind of magical world for me of certainty and intrigue. And in comparison, my personal everyday life was very complex and confusing. I was the only child I knew whose great-grandparents were raising her. They had reared 12 children of their own and had a half score of grandchildren. Only my lineage had a divorce, a consequence of which left them raising me. It's all kind of complicated and messy, but in my world of numbers, one plus one is always two. My fascination with math continued through geometric proofs and algebraic equations. My search for never-ending mathematical absolutes zipped me through all the available math courses at my middle school, so I embarked on college courses. And then in a flash, my le messy life got messier still. A stroke took my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather followed thereafter. I was alone and isolated with my faith and love of math to sustain me. But then on the upside, it's math. I had, <laughs> I had established a sort of noteworthy academic career for a young kid. And other people noticed, and before I knew it, I had a full ride scholarship to an elite all-girls boarding school in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Dana Hall was a fantastic mater, nurturing dreams and coddling fantasies to create mythical worlds that seemed to have no limits. It was safe and beautiful, and I do believe they scrubbed the sidewalks every day just to give it extra sparkle. My love of math soared. When I exhausted their math courses, they helped me enroll in math courses at nearby Wellesley College. Yep, I always wanted to be a mathematician until I didn't. It wasn't a single point in time or even a specific day that that change occurred. It took a few weeks. I started spending all my spare time, even weekends, in a closet. I think they call it love when your eyes get wide, your heart races, and no matter the conversation, it's all you can talk about. That described me whenever I thought about that closet. That's the place where the school's computer sat. It wasn't really a computer even. It was really a terminal that I used to use to phone up a computer at Dartmouth College. I enrolled in the computer class at Dana Hall because it was the only math course I had not taken. I could never have predicted its profound and lasting impact on my life. The certainty I enjoyed with math took physical form in programming. Numbers and equations were replaced with logical sequencing. My writings on paper became programs that others used to accomplish real world tasks. I was doing all kinds of stuff with computers too. No class, no activity, no sport in which I was involved could escape me writing a program for it. <laughs> Teachers, students, and even the administration were using my programs for all kinds of stuff like quiz reviews, sports simulations, word conjugations, automated art, and so on. It seemed as though I could get a computer to solve any problem, to do anything I wanted. 
What is a person who loves computers called, I asked. My teacher answered, a computer scientist. From that point forward, being a computer scientist is all I wanted to be. As the decades rolled by, I became just that, a computer scientist and a professor to train other computer scientists. The integration of creativity, mathematical certainty, and real world applicability that drove me passionately to computers in that course at Dana Hall has powered my life ever since. <clears throat> My work centers on creating new technologies to solve societal problems and performing experiments, like Deb mentioned, to show ways to harmonize technology with science, or in that case, to at least show that there really is a problem. 37 years after Dana Hall, with mixed gray hair, I entered a building this year whose doorway read Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC. Now, I'll be honest, all I knew about the FTC at the time was that every once in a while it seemed to like you would publish a report or a decision that impacted how business treated consumers, even businesses on the internet. How did the FTC become the consumer's police force? Why do their reports impact practices on what seems to be an anarchy, an anarchy called the internet? At the time I entered the building, I had no idea. The doors opened to reveal a lobby with walls of solid marble dimly lit by ceiling mounted fixtures that are outlined in silver metallic trim. It's the kind of space they just simply don't build like that anymore. And tucked in, and I think you can really appreciate it because tucked in the square hollow is this thing called, it has this moving door. I think it's called a phone booth, uh, but except there's no phone inside. So, but you can imagine what it was like in its heyday with people bustling about. Today, though, the lobby is very somber and quiet. It seems more like a museum. Its artifacts and secrets seem to lie behind a wall of security scanners and guards. I spent the whole day barely venturing from that lobby, giving biometrics, signing documents, doing online compliance training, creating lots of long and very complex passwords that I kept forgetting. Um, my first day as FTC's new chief technology officer ended with me learning nothing more about the FTC than when I entered. Nothing that day, the people, the place, or its marble walls gave a hint that I had entered Spider-Man's den. <laughs> Spider-Man is really, he's the champion of the little guy, for those of you who don't follow comics, and he is actually my favorite comic book superhero. Um, just so you know, what happens is there's an irritated spider who bites the regular human Peter Parker, and he gets uh, superhuman strength, reflexes, balance, and the ability to cling tenaciously to most surfaces. He improves his power through his own hard work, though, effort and training that he engages in, becoming strong enough to throw a car, lift 10 tons, uh, do gymnastic flips over entire buildings. Spider-Man only uses his powers to fight evil, and he does so for no other reason than doing the right thing. He struggles with daily finances, even though he saved the world from drug dealers, mobsters, and mad scientists. The local press scorns him at every turn despite his amazing, amazing feats of good. When facing his notorious foe, like the pumpkin throwing Green Goblin, he doesn't just start using his superpowers. Instead, he first uses his brain and he thinks of a plan. But what really cinched him for me was a connection Spider-Man had to my great grandparents. His code of honor, with great power comes great responsibility. It was the same as the biblical one my great-grandmother had instilled in me years earlier, from those to whom much is given, much is expected. The FTC has its own sort of unique combination of spree, strength, speed, and agility. Its mission is to protect consumers and pr promote competition. Under legislation sought by President Theodore Roosevelt, Congress created a, its predecessor, the Bureau of Corporations, in 1903. The main role of the Bureau was to study and report on industry with a focus on monopolies and, mono and monopolistic practices. About a decade later, the FTC evolved with its expanded reporting, enforcement, and policy mission. President Franklin Roosevelt laid the cornerstone at its headquarters at 600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the building with the marble walls that I mentioned. And he remarked, quote, may this permanent home of the Federal Trade Commission stand for all time as a symbol of the purpose of the government to insist on a greater application of the golden rule to conduct the corporation and business enterprises in their relationship to the public. I am not sure whether President Roosevelt foresaw corporations as people, but the FTC remains the prophetic keeper of the golden rule, 
holding corporations responsible for treating consumers fairly. I entered that building 100 years after Pro President Roosevelt said those words and have been there long enough to witness the FTC's evolved web spinning and slinging capabilities, the press constantly discounting its feats, and the relentless pursuits of his people seeking to do good. This speech is really not an, ins is not an insider analysis of the FTC or even an account of my time there. Instead, the occasion of this award purchased me on a peak from which I can see where I have been, where I am, and project where we might go. So now I'm in the government, so I have to now tell you, I am solely responsible for the content <laughs> characterizations, <laughs> ideas, and choice of topics in this speech. My comments do not necessarily reflect <laughs> the views of the FTC or any of its commissioners. The goal of this speech is to spark discussion and debate and move the world to better harmonization, harmonization of technology and society. I'm almost done. That was perfect. Why does, so let me look towards the future by looking at some historical background. Why does enjoying a camcorder, a new computer, or a football game mean you have to risk personal harms like loss of privacy? Sometimes we do enjoy advances in technology with protections like privacy, but how can we do so more often? So let me give you some historical cases to think about. In 1983, Sony introduced its camcorder, a mobile device for consumers to record video with sound. In the United States, you can usually video a person in public without his knowledge or consent, but if you want to record his conversation, electronic wiretapping laws dictate whether you must get his permission, and requirements vary among states. The camcorder had no mute button, making it impossible for consumers to capture video without sound. Replicating the design today, most mobile phones and digital cameras still record video with sound and provide no mute option. So as a consequence, people routinely shoot video that may violate wiretap laws. And in some states, people have faced felony charges as a result. For a fraction of a penny, a camcorder with a mute button would have harmonized camcorders with existing laws. In today's devices, a software option instead of a physical change would do the trick. However, broad adoption of these devices with no mute option seems to be changing American social and legal norms. In a 2007 case, a political activist reportedly violated a wiretapping statute by recording video of a Boston University police sergeant during a political protest. Today, legal challenges are moving in favor of individuals recording law enforcement officers in public. A news article describes a case of a parent wiring his special needs child and capturing insults hurled at the child by a bus driver and teachers. Last year, Pennsylvania passed a new law that allowed video cameras mounted on school buses to record video and sound. Did the technical design of mobile sound recording devices change societal norms? In January 1999, Intel wanted to enhance the security of online communications by embedding an unalterable unique number in the processor of personal computers. Their idea was that when a computer engaged in communication over the internet, the communication would include the processor's unique identifier, thereby associating the computer's action to its physical processor. Sales and usage records could further relate the processor to an owner and location. Within two months of the announcement, privacy and consumer groups filed complaints with the FTC. Their complaints argued that a unique number would also, could also allow unknown observers to track computer use across the internet, even if the user was not being malicious or doing anything wrong. Supplemental complaints explained that surreptitiously tracking the movements of individuals on the internet violated expectations of anonymity and of fairness and control over personal information. By April of 2000, Intel acquiesced and they abandoned it, it, their original technological approach due to privacy concerns. Today, mobile phones have unique numbers, media access control or MAC addresses, that are used for network communication, and that's a number that's unique to the phone beyond the phone number. Retail stores and other organizations are experimenting with using these unique identifiers to track the whereabouts of mobile phones in physical space, such as why you're shopping in the store. Is this a case of societal norm shifting about tracking or of society not yet aware of this aspect of wireless mobile communications? 
Let me give one more example. I want to make sure I don't run over time. They told me 15 minutes. Okay, keep. I'm almost done. Um, so the, the last example I'd like to give you is in January of 2001, police in Tampa, Florida tested facial recognition technology during Super Bowl 35, scanning faces of people in crowds, comparing them with images in a database of digital mugshots. A few months later, a council member in Jacksonville, Florida, introduced legislation banning the use of face recognition software by the sheriff's office and any other city agency. Other city councils and legislators considered similar legislation, but then came the events of 9-11, and they dramatically reversed the projected end for facial recognition technology. A decade later, facial recognition technology have flourished. Contents range from online social networks and mobile apps to digital signs. According to a 2012 FTC report, uses of facial recognition now include determining an individual's age range and gender in order to deliver targeted advertising, assessing viewers' emotions to see if they are engaged in a video game or a movie, or matching faces and identifying anonymous individuals in images. Is face recognition now harmonized with society? or might planned uses risk future disruption and abandonment. In these historical cases, technology design and uses clash with societal rules and concerns and user acceptance. Outcomes included revised laws, te technology disruptions, inconsistency, and an uncertain future. So we need to harmonize technology and society. And the insight that I would pose to you is that we have to help decision makers reason about how to optimally fuse technology, governance, and business across stakeholder interests. Today, different stakeholders get empowered in different situations. Sometimes when the technology company leads, the policy or the enforcement is left to only deal with the design as it's been dictated by the technology. No one group, technologists, policymakers, or advocates are sufficiently motivated or positioned to do the kind of unbiased big picture thinking that we need. As a result, society currently gets contests that yield poor results. I propose that we need a new discipline, which I currently coin technology science. A discipline often seeks to answer an overarching question, and this case is, how does society enjoy the benefits of new technology without societal harms? Perspectives of law, policy, and business are already present in technology society clashes. But we additionally need scientific methods like naturalistic observation, surveys, interviews, case studies, and experimentation. It's only through a full spectrum interdisciplinary approach that we can save the world. This is not unlike Justice Brandeis, whose pioneering writings about an individual's right to privacy examined and fused diverse elements of law into, uh, into one theory. So what do you call a person who receives the Brandeis Award? A Brandon, a Brandisian, or <laughs> a, Brand a Brandtician? My answer is a tireless servant. Thank you. <laughs>